Copyright University of Auckland, all rights reserved. The content and delivery of lectures in this course are protected by copyright. Material belonging to others may have been used in these lectures and copied by and solely for the educational purposes of the university under licence. You may record the lectures for the purposes of private study or research, but you may not sell, alter or further reproduce or distribute any part of these lectures to any other person. Failure to comply with the terms of this warning may expose you to legal action for copyright infringement by the copyright owner and or disciplinary action by the university. What's up, man? Not connected to it. How does that? We well, can see it on there, but it's not connected to the speakers. It should be working, shouldn't it? Okay. Do I try again? Um, it depends on. <laughs> I'll try again. Yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, it should be, shouldn't it? But it doesn't look as though they're on at all, though. That's the yeah. I, 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 sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I've maybe, tried that. Maybe, uh, maybe we'll just quickly yeah. try yeah, to try. see whether it actually that works. Yeah, see, there's nothing there either. Yeah, so it's actually uh, not this. No. It's, it's the projector. Um, Can we try turning it off? So... If you go into screen and displays and turn it off and on. Yep. Yeah, try that. Turn off. But never turned on. We, we, we try to turn it off first. Yeah. And then we turn, turn it back on. Yeah. So I've never had this problem before. No problem. <laughs> I've done... Always new problems. I've done hundreds of... That's weird, eh? Nobody set up now. Mm. It's not tech size, it's actually vector service management. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I might just introduce you. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. I might want to record as well. But okay, sorry. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, Unfortunately, we've got a problem with the technology thing and the, they're not working at all. So we've never had this problem before. So I'm Alex Sims and welcome everyone here. And so I'm going to have Jeremy speaking, um, Jeremy Stevens speaking on about blockchain, about um, why blockchain is not a readily acceptable development in New Zealand and the industry in the Caribbean. So Stephen is from the Department of Economics. So even though we're in commercial law, um, <laughs> Blockchains go to a whole lot of different disciplines, mm -hmm. and I know quite a few of you from other disciplines here, um, at, from the University of West Indies in Cave Hill campus. So I'm not quite sure I might have to speak a presentation with no slides. Um, and I'd just like to thank Virginia for setting up this um, uh, seminar at quite short notice. And the reason why it was quite short notice is Jeremy's only here for a couple of weeks, and I thought it would be better that people knew he was here than waited until doing a seminar just before he left. And I'm sure Jeremy will stay around later if anyone wants to um, talk. And again, very quickly, the reason why Jeremy kept with economics is I also do blockchain, so that's why. So, but not no problems. Um, is it being recorded? Is it being recorded? Um, just in case. Uh, speak up and I see. One, two, one, two, one, two. Yeah, but it's being recorded as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, perfect. All right, guys, so good afternoon. And luckily for me, I, I, I I've now adjusted to the times now, so it really does feel like early morning for me still, or ironically, although it's like seven o'clock in Barbados where I'm from. And oh, I forgot my manners, Kia ora. <laughs> yeah, uh, or if you were in Barbados, you know, roughly we're going on, right? <laughs> we got another Barbadian in the house. Um, 
Uh, just a bit of backdrop. It's just unfortunate that we don't have the slides done. I will try my best in my usual style back home when all our technology normally fails uh, <laughs> to, to, to try to make it as interactive as possible. There's just one slide I wish I was able to show you because I will, as part of the discussion, have to go into a bit of a technical side. Not too deep, but just enough so that you can buy certain arguments that I am trying to make or at least have a better grounding on the arguments I'm going to try to make today. Uh, my, my mission today is to try to show you both the reason, or you all, the reason why I came here in the first place. A uh, bit of a backdrop. I was looking for a place to just go and investigate the environment uh, with respect to blockchain technologies, with respect to cryptocurrencies. I would hope by the end of today's discussion, you will recognize that cryptocurrencies are just a small part of this thing called blockchain technologies. And there's a lot more benefit than just thinking about cryptocurrencies. And I was looking and I thought to myself, you know, which jurisdiction in the world is advanced in all types of social systems and whatnot, uh, economically and infrastructurally advanced, but yet has similar difficulties in adopting the technology that we call blockchain to what we get back in the Eastern Caribbean. Now, a bit more backdrop. When I say the Caribbean is like four different types of Caribbean, everybody from the Caribbean knows this. When you hear English speakers say Caribbean, they normally mean the English speaking Caribbean. Uh, when you hear people from Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic say Caribbean, it's Spanish speakers, including Cuba. And then you've got the French, and then you've got Dutch. So it goes on and on and on. So I chose the English speaking Caribbean because, ironically, uh, we share as an English speaking legacy the same political systems as you do have here, with the exception that you guys are unicaramel. While most of us in the Eastern Caribbean that are independent, but yet part of the Commonwealth, have bicaramel um, parliament, well, bicaramel systems of government, which means that things take a lot longer to get done legally than they normally would here in New Zealand, right? Um, yeah, our Senate hasn't, yeah, our, we have a legacy of a Senate that doesn't really do much, unfortunately. Despite it having a lot of attention this last election, right? Yeah, it's so funny. Uh, but on top of that, you know, I found it interesting that Alex was out there like a lone wolf as an academic, pushing something that I thought would have been obviously beneficial to a place that continues to be ranked number one in the doing business index, all right? Across all facets of um, indicators as posed by the World Bank, New Zealand ranks number one for the ease of doing business, you know, inclusiveness, enforcing contracts, that's probably your lowest ranking, I think that's around 30 something, so you legal guys in commercial law have a lot of work to do there. But nonetheless, collectively, New Zealand seems as a progressive place that is willing to invite all manner of business into New Zealand, I'm not saying suspicious manner, but in terms of technological, in terms of new industry, it's quite diverse, I imagine. Uh, your economy is like, what, 68% based, 68, yeah, around between 60 to 68% based on services, 3% based on agriculture. Before actually coming here, I always thought it was the other way around. So I had to really do some research. While in the Caribbean, uh, some of our brothers, Vincent, Dominica, for instance, would think that they more so depend on agriculture than um, New Zealand does. But ironically, the, we are very heavily dependent on services as well. So there's a lot of these commonalities, but yet there's also a commonality with respect to legacy systems being used in your commercial banking uh, system. And also in our financial system, we are quite fractured. In other words, we might have legacy systems, but I'm quite sure if I wanted to visit my brother there in um, St. Vincent and he took me out for drinking somewhere in Kingstown and I wanted to pay, I couldn't use my debit card. And believe it or not, it's like a half hour flight from Barbados over the sea. It's not far. We share the same um, optic fibers and whatnot for the internet, the same ones, all coming out of Miami, but yet the banks are so fractured that they don't want to utilize those economies or possible economies of scale to allow a lot more financial inclusion. That is allowing me to invest and spend easily in a sister island like even Jamaica, which is Western Caribbean. Yeah, it's, it's almost crazy. And I thought to myself, you know, New Zealand's having those struggles with respect to the commercial banking sector. Alex is out there pushing to educate people. I do my bit with blockchain technology, but I'm more so known for being a thorn under the government skin, 
Yeah, you're right to laugh, you know what I mean. But I, I try to also push a lot of innovation and a lot of solutions as well. So New Zealand, as an economy that is so far ahead in terms of e-government, in terms of governance, um, in terms of progression, social progression, I thought that this is the country that maybe the Eastern Caribbean should really aspire to be more so than what we were built on, like Singapore. Singapore's too far ahead. New Zealand is a little more just because of cultural norms, just because of historical norms, uh, just because of the fact you've got two big islands, just because of the fact that you've got volcanoes around you and we've got hurricanes. There's so many similarities. And, and it made sense for me to come here and to see, you know, with blockchain technology as a disruptive threat to the financial system here and other systems as well that we will examine that the Caribbean could very well just mirror what has been happening so far, but also there are lessons that we've learned because of our, well, sometimes very dodgy financial practices, believe it or not, lessons that we've learned that could also benefit this jurisdiction as well. So I, I just hope I'm very clear on where I want to go today, yeah? Cool. So then those objectives, just to keep things in mind so that no one asks me about trading, because Although, yes, I've made money from Bitcoin, I no longer trade because there's some strange stuff going on there. Uh, so I want to really expose you to further commonalities and differences and also lessons that could be learned, just to summarize there again. So how are we going to break this down? And unfortunately, you can't see it. I'm going to go through more <laughs> um, jurisdictional similarities. That's going to be very important just to set context and also differences. And then, for those of you who have an active interest, a uh, new interest, like my friends there, Georgina and whatnot, active interest on what blockchain technology is all about, I'm going to spend probably a good 10 minutes or so oversimplifying. Is this the rescue? Yes, it is. <laughs> One second. Well, I could continue talking. I'm going to probably spend around 10 to 15 minutes or so um, trying to really expose people to a lighter side of blockchain technology while trying to ensure that you see a difference or see that blockchain technology is just more than the cryptocurrencies you've all heard about. Show of hands, everybody in here has heard about Bitcoin, right? But you've heard of EOS, you've heard of NEM, um, you've heard of Ethereum, Ether. So there's quite a few, but blockchain technologies provide so much more benefit. And believe you me, those cryptocurrencies are a small, great, a small fragment of the value provided by these systems. But most importantly, I then have to define what are blockchain. What's the blockchain? Thank you so much. You. Yeah. And then I want to show some observations I've had. I need to really at this time thank Alex for having the express patience with me as she it pushed me to really go into quite a few working shops and quite a few networking sessions. It's really been good in setting my ideas uh, going forward. And I want to then go on to expose to you some observations of what has been happening in the Caribbean, in the blockchain space. It's actually a lot more advanced than you may be thinking right now, but we don't have any kind of regulatory clarity in the independent Caribbean, in the more so colonial Caribbean, so Bermuda and Anguilla, those countries, there's clearance, there's some form of regulatory clarity that has made them attractive for all kinds of companies to set up there very recently. And then the final part, part which would be a bit of a question and an answer, you know, where do both jurisdictions go? I've, I've got my views, but again, I'm open to, since this is multidisciplinary, I'm open to knowing you know, what objections you have currently in your own jurisdiction and how maybe I should reconsider some things I'm thinking, yeah? And you can ask further questions because I expect at least one political question from my brethren there from the Caribbean, for sure. <laughs> All right, so I don't really like PowerPoint, I'll tell you that straight up, but I just am using this as a reference and I will talk around it. There's so many similarities, I could not fit them all into this um, presentation but there are quite a few that are very important. Again, the fact that we have parliamentary democracies under the constitutional monarchy, so the queen we all celebrate. The only difference is some islands in the Caribbean will not carry um, the queen on their money, while there are islands that do quite similarly to New Zealand in some respects. Uh, we are Commonwealth countries, and it was very, very hard for me to come to New Zealand and have to get a visa. First time I've ever gone to a Commonwealth country and had to get a visa, um, but you know, 
it's still a lovely place. And, <laughs> and also, we are very heavily dependent on large and near-field economies. So China is responsible for most of your imports and exports, uh, followed very closely by Australia. Quite so, the Eastern Caribbean has that legacy, believe it or not, not with South America, which is closer geographically, but with the United States of America and England, old Queen England. And we are also very, very, very popular consumers of narcotics. <laughs> believe it or not, when I, when I, I, I found that to be very interesting because believe you me, blockchain technology could help with your, legal, your quest for legalization of marijuana. So as much as it may seem like a joke, it's actually quite important. And maybe in Canada, we will use Canada and their recent legalization across federal Canada as an example going forward, since Canada is a nice environment for blockchain technology as well. All right. Uh, furthermore, with small open economies, I actually was shocked to hear New Zealanders refer to themselves as small. But I understand it now that I'm here. And because of that, there's certain economic vulnerabilities that we have to ensure we protect ourselves from. Um, that's the reason you guys have a strong monetary envir environment, a very strong management of your dollar, similarly to the OECS and Barbados, although that is weakening in our case, sadly. Uh, some more of that is important. The fact that, and I need to draw Barbados out in this case because I would never go on record and say that St. Vincent, for instance, uh, has a long legacy of a stable democracy or low corruption. But New Zealand has that, Barbados has, Barbados has that, somewhat Dominica, but it's fractured, but generally as a block, it's relatively low when it comes to corruption. If you check most indices, the Caribbean ranks favorably considering our size as well, the Eastern Caribbean. Um, in the case of Barbados and some of the other OECS islands, such as St. Kitts, for instance, and Grenada, upper middle class societies, so then there's certain consumer behaviors that one may expect that both economies would share. And funnily enough, we do share them, but they're not being very obvious to me here, nor in the Eastern Caribbean. And last but not least, you know, strong but conservative monetary and banking environments. Your banks aren't known to take very, a lot of risk. And if I'm to take Trinidad and Tobago out of the Eastern Caribbean equation, you know, we tend to, just like New Zealand, import our banking services. Yeah, as we know, there's a RBTT, well, our RBC from Canada, or Scotia Bank in Canada. Many Canadian banks are running the business in the Eastern Caribbean, but locally we have a strong credit union movement. That's not so obvious here. So it's very stable in, the, in that sense. But then, you know, we share these similarities as well too, with the exception that, you know, we would watch more rugby than play. Barbados tries to play rugby, but I guess our guys aren't big enough, and we probably need to invent our own version of a hacker to look serious. And we do give a bit of trouble with netball, and you know, up to about 15 years ago, we would have been beating you guys at cricket, but that no longer happens. So the similarities really end there, in terms of stark similarities. But in terms of jurisdictional differences that make blockchain technology probably more appealing than we might be given credit for, are as follows, you know, the fact that you guys are socially progressive, it could, blockchain technology, as I define it later on, could be utilized in several industries in a way to bring um, groups that may not have much of a voice up to the forefront and allow them to have more of a voice. And this is in the area of, say, a digital identity. Um, this is in the area of information freedom. There's a bunch of areas that blockchain technology could be rather useful, in my view, for bringing impoverished and uh, minority groups to the forefront in terms of having a voice. In the Caribbean, we might be tolerant, generally, but we are not known to be that socially progressive. And that's a, a hard truth, especially when you come here. You think you're tolerant until you come to New Zealand. Let's put it that way, especially coming where we've come from. Um, the World Bank Ease of Doing Business Index, I mentioned that earlier. You guys reign supreme, and Barbados used to be top, but now we are somewhere in the middle of the region. And St. Vincent is actually above Barbados now in doing business, and I find that to be amazing and good. You know, <coughs> Dominica, Jamaica is in the top 100 worldwide, I think top, top 60 as well as a jurisdiction in terms of ease of doing business. And if you guys ever are interested, you should really look at Jamaica as a case study of what you would call rapid economic progression. After years and years and years of being in economic doldrums, they're doing a good job over there that I think we should mirror in Barbados. But nonetheless, you know, 
the ease of doing business here allows, in my mind, a way for you, if you utilize blockchain technology as defined later on, to become even more competitive and appealing to that wide array of businesses that you have commonly been inviting into your jurisdiction. The same for the Caribbean, but we need to get other systems, legacy systems working first. You know, um, the fact here that your uh, IRD, your tax authority, has a very simplified, and I really had to take my time on this, a simplified tax framework not only makes you appealing and makes it easier once they have a position on blockchain technology and cryptocurrencies for you to rapidly move along as becoming an attractive jurisdiction for blockchain businesses. Uh, in Barbados, we have one set of tax laws. And although the Eastern Caribbean, and in addition to Jamaica, Guyana, Suriname, uh, are all signatories of this thing called the Treaty of Chagaramas, which is supposed to harmonize our financial uh, environments, our social environments and whatnot, we haven't been willing participants to this um, treaty, sadly. So you've got a bunch of fractures going on. You've got, a, well, a heavily complicated tax system in Barbados, but an overly simplified one in Guyana, for instance, which probably is even more simple than the one here in terms of um, tax law and whatnot. So again, New Zealand wants utilizing blockchain technology as a jurisdiction could really exploit the simplified tax network or tax, uh, tri tax frameworks. You know, you've got great infrastructure capital wise, so already you've got the bandwidth. In the Caribbean, we have it from a bandwidth perspective, but when it comes to other capital projects, buildings, roads and whatnot, because of where we live as a high risk jurisdiction um, with hurricanes and whatnot, it doesn't necessarily lend to us dropping a building or road there and not looking to repair it in a few months time if you get where I'm coming from. So that's another cost that really differentiates our ease or the ease for us to advance forward with blockchain technology. Um, the industrialization by invitation programs, I called it so just for commonality, but the fact is that New Zealand is an easy place to set up a business. I can do it online <laughs> well, within minutes. And whereas in Barbados, you need to be physically present. In Jamaica, I think you guys are getting ahead in terms of that as well too, being able to, you need to be present, but you can get a decision quicker. In St. Vincent, it takes weeks perhaps to set up a corporation. So again, another advantage that you've got. Uh, furthermore, currently you've got a proliferation of blockchain businesses here already doing interesting things. You've got some doing exchanges, which would allow each and every one of you to probably buy any cryptocurrency you're looking for, but there's more than that. People in, uh, are being involved in, 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 in systems that would benefit registries, digital asset registries, for instance. You know, um, you also have got the case where you, you have some that might be into, well, not digital asset registries, but others that I would point out a little later on. But the fact is in the Caribbean, we don't have a proliferation of businesses uh, generally, but to involve Jamaica again, which is Western Caribbean, you know, they've got a lot more IT related businesses that are possibly examining um, blockchain. But the problem is in the Caribbean, the business that is being tackled right now, and this actually quite hurts me, although it is important since the Caribbean is like almost 60% unbanked, right, is financial inclusiveness. So you want that the, app, the farmer in Haiti, for instance, who is far outside of Port-au-Prince, that he's able to be included in the financial system. Now, you know, if any of you heard about what's going on in Kenya and has been going on there for about 10 years, you know, they pretty much have been using mobile technology to the M through the M-Pesa to allow anybody across Kenya to be part of that financial system. And it's done leaps and bounds and wonders for their economy. It's been growing steadily around 5% per annum for the last 10 years or so. It's been amazing what's happened in Kenya. And it's also had kind of flattened the social structure in Kenya. You know, the very poor can still survive, but that still is not the case in the Caribbean. And most of our businesses, uh, blockchain related businesses, seem very caught up with M-commerce related businesses. So retail or that I, as a small business owner, should be able to receive some kind of value from anyone and not necessarily have to pay through the ears for an e-commerce solution, because e-commerce in the Caribbean is prohibitively expensive. It actually makes no sense to set up a business online using any bank in our, in our jurisdiction 
simply because of the economies of scale. It's just too small and the transaction fees are way too high. So again, financial inclusion, it has been the only thing. Yet we've got governments, uh, case in point, just bought some property. And up to now, I have no idea who really holds the title deed um, to my property because I took a mortgage. I have no idea where the banks are holding it. They say in a vault. In fact, I don't even know if the banks are holding it. I don't know if the government is holding it because we do have a registry as well that holds title deeds. I have no idea. And thank God Barbados is small and I can walk up to a politician's door and keep noise, right? <laughs> keep noise if something goes wrong. But imagine now the case of Cuba or the case of Jamaica. Let's use Jamaica. Again, I'm overusing Jamaica, but Jamaica is quite big, as big as North Island. So it would, a guy out in, um, which parish is uh, Mobe again? The parish? St. James. St. James. So a guy all the way out in St. James, and most of the government institutions are down in Kingston, and that's all down in St. Andrew towards the southeast. All right? That guy in the mountains of St. James, for instance, buys a property, somehow manages to get a mortgage. He is even more unsure as to where his title deeds are. And, and, and imagine the kind of disputes that could happen, especially when family members die in the Caribbean, the kind of disputes that come up over title deeds. It is, it is obviously a monstrosity. And I can see applications there, but our governments aren't willing. And I can see more of a value than convincing my brothers there and myself to trade cryptocurrency. I can see way more value for the economy of the Caribbean in areas like that, if you see where I'm coming from. So for me, I think the general reluctance towards blockchain technology in so far at this point um, in New Zealand is quite mind boggling, to be honest, considering the fact that it can lessen the cost of economic systems. It can lessen transaction costs. Like for me as an economist, that is a huge value proposition because that begins to filter in to other things. But I can tell commercial lawyers or lawyers in general might not like this. Because well, as I get to define more and more how a blockchain works, there's less need for middlemen because of the fact that you inherently have trust in the system. The system doesn't need a central authority that you trust. You trust the system. I'll go on to explain in a bit. But in so far, any questions that we have? Any questions so far at all on anything I've said? I've got a few, actually. Well, go ahead. Right. for a country, and I know you right. talked about that being successful and flattening the social inequalities in yes. Kenya. How widespread is that? I, I haven't looked in this, at this in Not, country, it, so okay. um, I'm just wondering how much we, our planet, can continue to mm. grow economically without there being everything running out, to use mm. cliche, so that's one. Mm. And also, just, I've got, and I can continue this conversation by email or whatever yeah. in a later stage, but I think that it's a myth that the New Zealand tax system is, is simple. I think it's full of holes. Oh, and, okay. And no that problem. Leads to a great deal of uncertainty. All right, but remember, this is a, con a relative comparison. If you want holes. No, 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 no. I'm just, I'm just <laughs> saying, I <laughs> But uh, let, me, let me actually share a joke with you. If I wanted to commit tax fraud in Barbados, the easiest way for me to commit tax fraud in Barbados is to get somebody pregnant. You, you, you file your taxes, right? So you know what I mean. You can claim tax deductions on children. And, but, but, but hold on, hold on, but, but hold on, hold on. But it can be exploited in a society where marriage isn't necessarily something that is popular. So I can jump in and out of a relationship and decide, well, look, put me on, not put me on the chills on the uh, birth certificate, but you can get the tax authorities to acknowledge that I am the stepfather and I can claim back on this child. Now, it's, it, no, no, um, not everything. There's a fixed amount. It's up to about a well, $1,000 a child or something like that. But in our societies, no, it doesn't make a difference because incomes have gone much higher. And the politicians recognize this loophole. The great Chris Sinclair recognizes <laughs> our former minister of finance, whom I don't really have much time for. Um, former. former, yeah, former. Yeah, because he's no longer in government. So he, he, um, Smartly, one of the smart things he did was to recognize that that was a major loophole that people were exploiting, you know, claiming children that weren't theirs. So, I mean, for me, something as simple as that, I don't think would necessarily exist here. And the, the stepfather looking after the child? 
does it does it even matter if you were or not? Just it, it, no, because I could collude with the mother. If the mother has nobody taking care, I can collude. I don't have to be taken care. So case in point. And I'm glad you actually brought this up because these are the, the issues that blockchain technology is supposed to help solve, supposed to. But I'll answer the next question. Mm -hmm. um, but all right, I was in a relationship once where there were two children involved. Mm -hmm. And it almost boggled my mind when the mother suggested if I wanted to claim. It boggled my mind. I was, it was like what, four or five months in to the relationship. And I was helping her with her taxes because I could do that stuff. So, but that's just one example of a boat. Yeah. Personally, I don't. I think that children are a huge investment. Agreed. Um, and I, I love the fact that a country, I haven't thought about that. It's a new tax rule that I've never come across before. It's okay. fascinating. Okay. Um, but I think New Zealand used to have a child care credit that you could yeah. get. Because mm -hmm. for many people, the only reason their child is in child care is in order for them to go to work. So it should be, I think that's, that's fine. Okay. Um, I don't know, I haven't thought about the full implications of this deduction that you've No problem. Discussed, but I'm not, on a, on a um, principle basis, I'm not, I don't have any problem with it as long mm. as it's applied correctly. But just more that I'm a foreigner, I moved here five years ago, and I was under the illusion that the New Zealand tax system was very straightforward, GST was just mm. straightforward, and I've had to learn all this since I've, I've arrived in the country, as I'm from the UK. Um, and it's, I, I still maintain it's a myth, because right. it's, it just means that there's no certainty. There are huge areas of the rule that are tax rule that haven't been explored. And you can call up the Inland Revenue and they'll give you incorrect information over the phone. Okay. Because I was just did this with my I'm a fundraiser for my school, so I just wanted to tell my book of um compiled a report. Okay. Anyway, I don't want to get into the details. No worries. But they categorically told me wrong, wrong information after checking with every policy person. Understood. But we could we let's discuss okay. that a little later on because trust me, you'll be amazed at the loopholes that I, that you can find. Um, but nonetheless, no tax system is perfect, you know? And the irony is that blockchain, and I'll answer the other question afterwards too, but no, um, the good thing about blockchain technology is that the hope is, is that you're able to always govern, uh, well, always govern some form of transactions in a secure, but also very omnipresent manner. So the funny thing is, is that this is probably the best definition I've ever seen of blockchain technology here, you know? That a blockchain is incorruptible, and because I, I had this discussion with David yesterday that it's not necessarily immutable, <laughs> but it could be incorruptible in a sense. Incorruptible digital ledger of economic, and I put that in quotation marks because it doesn't mean monetary of such, but just value, something that benefits the other party or both parties. Uh, transactions that can be programmed to record, not just financial transactions, but virtually everything of value. And everything of value is everything, you know, everything. So it is a form of a ledger. Some people have misconceptions that there's some token actual thing that could be physically represented, transferred between people, but really it's just a bunch of computers voluntarily uh, committed to that system, uh, or sometimes not necessarily voluntarily, all across geographical spaces that are keeping the same records of each transaction. Now, it can become a little confusing when you start to get into how do these computers agree on what is a correct transaction or, or did, um, did it Alex just actually commit this transaction just now? Or did Jeremy commit this transaction just now? Or do we agree that Alex or some of us agree that Alex did not commit that transaction? What others do? Leaving uh, scope for this thing called double spending where you can actually end up committing the same transaction more than once while not actually having to give up that value twice, for instance, or more than once. So the blockchain technology, I'm not going to get too much into the tech side of it, but it gets rather interesting. Um, I would say that it's very important to probably visualize, and I took this down from Block Geeks, it's a nice resource, visualize what these networks mean. So currently, you know, most networks, think of computer networks for a minute. Let's not think about economics, just let's think about how you use computers. Or better yet, if any of you ever downloaded music illegally, think of Napster, all right? Or think of any peer-to-peer -peer network. Commonly, or before Napster and before peer-to-peer -peer networks became popular, computer networks were only able to transmit value through some form of a central resource. So you would see, uh, for instance, under centralized, 
there was one central point where everybody communicated and that central point would decide in a sense how that value was distributed on the network. So when you look at that, you think, for instance, let's see, Facebook, Cambridge Analytica, and so on and so forth. So there's one point of central failure and there's also one point of trust that can misuse that trust, sadly. Oh, and also then you would have other forms of decentralized networks, but common nodes that also had decision-making power on the networks. Again, fewer points, or sorry, more points of central failure, but also more points that might not communicate necessarily the same information. So for instance, down here, that node right there might never be aware of what's going on in the nodes above. So therefore, it's difficult to achieve consensus. Uh, earlier forms of digital currencies used networks like this, for instance. So Amazon, for instance, might have Amazon credits that could be spent amongst a few partner companies. But, you know, maybe there's benefit that could be had outside of that partner network, sadly. And they might not achieve or, or, or view the value of those cryptocurrencies or that information or economic transactions as being as valuable to the Amazon partners and therefore they could disrupt value. So the great thing about um, distributed ledgers or blockchain technology outside of all the mechanisms, outside of the technical side of it, is that when you start to look over here with distributed ledgers, everyone is aware of what everyone is doing in the system. But you can choose as part of consensus, just think about consensus in a general way, everyone on there agrees and it's codified, right? That these, that certain things are important to achieve consensus. So as I showed my friend David yesterday, um, blockchain, and probably I would at the end of this presentation, blockchain.info, you could see all transactions committed on the Bitcoin blockchain going back as far back as when the blockchain was created, number one, and you could see certain things. Person's public keys, those are like account numbers, think of it that way, and it also is a measure of security. You can see that going back. You can see how many transactions that particular key committed. You can see how much Bitcoin it earned versus how much Bitcoin it spent over time. You can see who it sent the money to, other public keys. And this is why regulators are rather important actors in my mind um, when it comes to public blockchains, because if it were that exchanges, which you all are aware of, are, are the sole ones, let's imagine for a moment, um, that could issue a public key, or issue you an account on the blockchain. And regulators are somewhat in twine or in tune with what these um, exchanges are doing. Then it's rather easy for regulators not to even bother to, to, to even um, deal with the exchanges if they wanted to monitor someone's suspicious transactions. All they needed to know from the regulator was what? The public key. And I can go back in perpetuity. I could see if, I, if there's a another public key that was red flagged for terrorist financing, for instance, I could see how often they exchange value. I could see where that terrorist uh, financier was able to get their Bitcoin from. Generally, this is the benefit of a blockchain being that kind of ledger that, that is as transparent as everyone on that blockchain wants it to be. Some blockchains could be even more transparent, for instance. You know, when we start going into things like uh, smart contracts in a bit, and you can determine what in that contract is for public consumption. Or furthermore, if you look at this blue one here, I was looking at Bitcoin in terms of anonymous, the red one, which says, well, look, only public keys are available. But then you can have what you call permission networks, which is similar, but more information is available to those persons in that network. Permission networks also don't invite any and everybody. So you have to give up something. The opportunity cost for entry is much higher. You have to give up some bit of anonymity. Because, for instance, right now with the Bitcoin blockchain, if I'm enough of a quarter, I can create my own account of sorts or generate my own public private keys on that blockchain. It doesn't mean I can't be tracked. It just means it's much more difficult to link that public key or that ID to me, the person right now, if you see where I'm coming from. So in terms of the evolution of blockchains, I think it's going to become more so permission networks. Um, in the future, where governments and regulators will try very closely not to necessarily kill the technology, but more so say what you have to give up in order to be a part of it, and also what we need in order to ensure that bad actors are kept 
at a minimum in terms of their influence, and good actors are rewarded accordingly. So there's a lot of benefits, but for me, I was not 100% clear if it would have been just lawyers in the room, if it would have been just economists as well, or just persons with a passing interest. But for me, I want you generally to think of one benefit in my mind that stands above all. The fact that decentralization or decentralized networks such as blockchains are more secure. And David kind of jogged this in my mind in our conversation yesterday, you know, that there's no, uh, in terms of security, these are probably the more secure forms of networks simply due to the fact that there's no central point of failure. Anyone who's um, been involved in IT or even banking knows the importance of ensuring that my servers, my redundancy servers even more so, are kept far as possible away from high risk situations. Uh, in the Caribbean, for instance, since any of us could be knocked over by a hurricane anytime soon, most redundancy tends to happen in the United States of America. So everything is backed up locally, but also there are quite a few financial institutions that tend to do redundancy offshore as well, or away from water, or away from the beach as much as possible. So in Barbados, all of our redundancy, well, most of our redundancy servers, local ones, are based not at the highest point in the island, but the area which is least likely to flood. So that's around the Sheraton area, Sheraton Mall and whatnot. So for, for as long as I have known IT guys, they've been practicing this form of redundancy. The whole thing is if you want to secure data, you need to think of it in the physical form. So we want to keep servers as far as possible from each other. So the thing about blockchain is because you've got similar ledgers being all across the world. At any point, if part of the network goes down, the thinking is, is that the network can still survive that. So for me, if part of the network is attacked and somehow the virus changes a morsel of the functionality of any of those nodes, it's booted off the system. Nobody acknowledges it. So it's the most secure form of network I know of right now as well. And even with like, consensus things such as proof of work and proof of stake, which I'll explain in a moment, very simple. Uh, concepts to understand, e but even with those consensus concepts, you know, for me, the fact that it is decentralized still makes it more appealing. Uh, so as I promised, proof of work. If a, for, imagine a Bitcoin transaction very quickly. You decide to send some money over to Gahan, some Bitcoin over to Gahan. There's no real money going over there, but there's a bunch of, let's say, ledgers or nodes that are aware that this transaction has occurred. The thing is you need to, however, make this transaction or to verify that this transaction has occurred. And that's where miners come in. So computers actually compete, or these certain nodes would compete to say, well, this transaction has occurred. And they do what you call a process called hashing. So hashing is like a verification process. Think of it that way. It's a computationally expensive process. It requires a lot of computational power. So when you guys hear that Bitcoin uses up a lot of power, it's literally because there's these computers, these nodes, most of them in China, that are verifying these transactions. And the more users you have on, or more transactions you have on the Bitcoin network, the more electricity you use because it becomes much more difficult to hash. In other words, to verify that the transaction has occurred. So that's proof of work. But proof of stake, on the other hand, you want me to explain it again? Because I just saw, uh, you sure? <laughs> All right, but now with proof of stake, that's the difference. Ethereum uses proof of stake. Uh, and that simply says any person that, has, that is most, has the most to lose in the system is the person that could verify a transaction. So for instance, some of your nodes could stake Ether. That is commit some Ether to the system in a sense. And it says, well, proof of stake says this person or any other that has committed most of their resources or has most of the coins or the crypto in that system should be allowed to verify a transaction. So it's not computationally expensive, but you can see right away there's security risk. And also there's a greater possibility of collusion. So the great thing is that blockchain technology has evolved so far that you've got hybrids of those two consensuses so that you use less computing power per se, to verify a transaction, but also, you know, you have a perverse incentive. The person who has the most to lose is the one that wants to verify that the transactions <coughs> have gone through. And the beauty of that 
is that you're ever evolving to the point where the security of new blockchains has been better and better and better. So Bitcoin, which was seen as the paramount one, and even Ethereum, which two, three years ago was hacked badly, there are blockchains that are coming out that are even more secure than that. So when I hear regulators and persons worried about the security aspect, to me, the point of failure then is more so the end user and not necessarily the system. That, that, and that to me is a good system. If your end user is your weakest point, then by all means, that's the best system possible. So because it's become way more secure and because it, it allows the speed of transactions have actually increased too. There's some um, blockchains that allow you to verify a transaction in minutes as opposed to Bitcoin, which was 10 minutes. You know, so it's almost as quick, if not, well, becoming quicker and quicker to the point where they can very well, in a few years, match the Visa or MasterCard network, which is seen as the fastest one we've got available right now. Yeah? So for me, it's becoming more and more of a platform that allows for increased B2B, so business to business, business to consumer, consumer to consumer transactions. For me, that's where I see blockchain technology going. So some good examples of what blockchain technology can evolve to include. Most of us, again, still think about financial inclusion or for us that are libertarian, a way for us to get away from the man and, and conduct transactions on our own steam. But funnily enough, the use cases are growing daily. Smart contracts, something that lawyers should be really interested in. In fact, if I was, and I try to speak to law students at KFO, I tell them, learn a bit of computer programming because in about 15 years, it's gonna become a central part of what you do. It's all well and good to be able to write up a contract or have templates and you amend those templates accordingly, but in a few years, you're going to have to write code on the blockchain but, but sorry, let me step back. How many of you actually are aware of what a smart contract is? That's the question I need to ask. Well, so quite a few. All right, so let me step back a bit so to let you see how you move from just transferring financial value to transferring secure information. A contract, as we know, basically binds to, uh, a few actors together. Yeah? It binds the person who, may, well, in, in finance, we say the writer of a contract, so the person who sets the terms, and the other person who would be agreeing to such terms. Now, the thing about blockchain technology, or let's think about how contracts are sent by email. You know, I decide I'm gonna send a contract over to someone, that person signs and sends back a copy to me. Is that a verifiable source or verifiable agreement in your mind? Legally in Barbados, it is seen as verifiable. But the problem is, is that one could argue that the, what was emailed back and signed and received wasn't the actual contract, but a copy. So you know, for instance, some people use, um, I don't know what you guys call them here, but we call them JPs, Justice of, Justices of Peace, of the Peace. We use them to verify the originality um, in Barbados of some document, which states, well, look, we can be sure that this is what was agreed to, this piece of, um, of, of a document was agreed to. But with email, because you're sending copies, like what really was the agreed to email? That's the question, the dilemma that you can have. It might not seem like that much of a dilemma, but somebody could actually use it as a plausible argument, at least where we come from. This is not the original document. I never signed the original document, I signed a copy. And because you know, legally, you can't sign a copy and say that's enforceable, then what goes on there? The good thing is, is that with blockchain, everyone, let's, before we even get into the dynamics of a smart contract, but everyone, can be aware that an action was done at a particular point of time because there's some record of that action being done in several places that are verifiable and trusted. So for instance, these contracts now aren't some PDF copy and whatnot, but rather these contracts are pieces of code that are like metadata. Think of metadata like name, email addresses, the servers, the email pass through, the time the email, was sent from one person to the next. So there's code that would be attached to this transaction. The code would be activated on a network given certain terms being achieved. Both actors who are signatories to that code or that contract would always state when the code is supposed to be acted upon. So think about an insurance contract. Um, for argument's sake, I'm a crazy driver in New Zealand. I've been driving since I got here. And people here drive way slower than I thought they should, right? <laughs> way slower. 
Doesn't mean I've been breaking the law, it just means I've been driving a, a little faster than I, I normally should be. So, imagine that there was some kind of geo-tracking software, Internet of Things, some device in my car engine that tracked my speed, but it was on the blockchain. So at any given time, not only are the police aware of my speed, but the insurance company is aware of my speed. Hmm? That's a permission system. Remember, there were two differences. The more so anonymous system is going against the man. I'm just giving an example of, of how the man could actually become more of the man, right? <laughs> but <laughs> but so, so just imagine, for instance, so the police are aware. The police are, they have a, a node on the blockchain. The insurance companies are aware. They have a node on the blockchain. And the variable that is being put into the code, the contract I signed with my insurance company, is my speed my speed and if I got into an accident above a certain speed. So if those, that two set of data is shot over to the contract, the contract then could become null and void, if you see where I'm coming from. Whereas on the other hand, for argument's sake, imagine if it was somebody else's fault, their contract could come to pay me. Or, well, you wouldn't be paid in cash, you'd be paid more so in the crypto. And then you would have to, via the company or an exchange, cash out, cash in, however you wish to go. See how seamless that is. That's seamless and it's verifiable. And that's the amazing thing. So smart contracts, it's just code. Just metadata sent between computers that's acted upon given certain conditions. Nothing more. Beautiful. Gets rid of all the paper and the need for lawyers that like to write a lot. But please, guys, if you are a lawyer, learn the code if you plan on working in 15 years. Um, the sharing economy, so we're th thinking about Uber, how much more effective Uber could be, for instance, if it were that Nodes on the blockchain were aware um, if you were in a car, let's say with a guy who the network is aware is a little crazy. It could actually have more effective rating systems, for instance, as a result. It wouldn't be biased on a guy's conversation, but his actual track record, how fast he drives, how, how if he takes routes that are off the route that Uber suggests, all of that stuff. Uh, the crowdfunding, governance, supply chain auditing. I need not go any further than what Maersk is doing. I, I literally saw a MERS container yesterday afternoon, and I was like, you know what? I need to add that to my example. But Walmart is a perfect uh, fit. They have tests run using, it was IBM's device. Which one it was? That Hyperledger. Hyperledger. Right, so Walmart is now able to track and to allow customers and end users to track an orange, let's say, that is grown in Mexico under certain conditions and while it's being in transmi transmitted, they're always aware of when and what conditions um, it's been transmitted. And it's verifiable since so many actors are on the system. But go ahead, Alex. Just on that, if you've got free cars, safety thing, there's some net RTUV that's got them six yeah. days on their current system to work out where it came from. You can hardly ever have where it can take six seconds. Yep. That's the difference. Yep. And imagine what I can do for persons in the Caribbean, especially too, when we get our bad bananas out of Mexico, whereas we could just choose better ones from St. Vincent. But nonetheless, health and food safety is important, especially in the regime I come from. Right? Very, very important where I come from. I imagine it is so here, but you've got better systems that police that than what we do. So supply chain auditing, file storage, David, we spoke about that yesterday. You know, how you can, David's question to me yesterday was very interesting. He says, you know, if you've got more and more data being generated, more and more data being generated on a blockchain, more of you on Instagram putting nice pictures of yourself up, you know, sharing videos of you and your children, traveling, sharing experiences, eventually it must run out in terms of resources. I said, no, there's always new methods of how you deal with data. So there's data compression, but also you can also split data up. So on the blockchain, for instance, you could store part of your files on that server. And that server is always aware that another server has another part of it. So data compression and file splitting is what I call is how blockchain technology could be useful. Sorry. Oh, yeah. My bad. <laughs> all, right, all right, I'm done soon. No problem. Thanks. Wasn't too sure. So prediction markets, protection of intellectual property, Internet of Things, renewable energy, AML and KYC. Everybody is aware of everybody in a permission network. It works. Uh, very, very quickly, start trading, and now I move on to the substantial points very quickly. The only observation I've got on the negative side is 
it's very strange that the tax authorities haven't offered some form of uh, clarity as to how you may treat, yeah, some kind of clarity. Uh, that, that I found that to be strange. I would think that given the proliferation of businesses, the willingness of the businesses that I've seen here to share information with the regulators and tax authorities, that a position, a stronger position would be held on things like security tokens versus utility tokens. We can speak about that afterwards. You know, that's an important thing. And in the United States of America, they've been treating it rather, treating to it rather interestingly, but it's important for tax reasons to establish if Bitcoin is a security versus if it's a currency or if it's just part, if it offers utility, something like that. That's the only real negative on top of the fact that the banks have been closing accounts still, even if the business isn't involved in securities trading or any form of securities trading, but more so allowing people to access a network or to, to post um, digital asset identities online or something. So it, I found that to be interesting. Uh, but in the Caribbean, you know, we, we've begun to get these regulatory sandboxes in Barbados, for instance. Um, there's this firm, Let's Caribbean, that has been instrumental in attracting big players in blockchain like Cardano and Poliniux and whatnot into Barbados and setting them up using our international business legislation, which is friendly once you're acting outside of the outside of Barbados. So you're not selling to Barbadians. So we borrow definitions of securities and utilities and whatnot from the jurisdiction in which you are actively trading in. Um, our banks have been, just like here, not friendly towards blockchain businesses. They've been closing accounts for the most part. But the good thing is, is that the credit union movement, which is very prohibited in how it can bank, um, they have been quite open in offering operational accounts to local, the local side businesses as well. The international businesses, they, they get access to banking simply because they don't sell to locals. Uh, also, the fact that we haven't, as a jurisdiction generally, defined the security tokens locally versus uh, utility tokens. I will say, however, at least I know Antigua and Barbuda officially and St. Lucia to a lesser extent are pushing legislation, particularly to deal with cryptocurrency and blockchain businesses. Others may very well follow very, very soon. Uh, so this is the question and answer part. You can ask questions, but my thinking is, if you could, we need to examine where we go from here because I see a lot of benefit um, to allow the explosion of the economic growth of my region, but also to continue allowing New Zealand to be competitive along with the themes of inclusiveness and openness to the general uh, business community globally. Thank you for your time so far. Yes, Dawn. Despite not being your area of residence, but you may know of it, uh, the impact of blockchain technology on uh, labor standards and work, particularly around wage theft mm. and theft payment of wages, do you see any potential there or do you know anyone working in that space? I don't know. You just gave me a good research idea. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I currently don't know. I, I do have a position, though. I, I don't have a position with respect to here but I think it's actually better for wage equality in the Caribbean from a number of perspectives. Uh, number one, as I was telling David, because David really was helpful in this presentation just as much as Alex as well. Um, as I was telling him yesterday, you know, there's a lot, and telling others, there are a lot of these developers and, and whatnot who are trained in blockchain tech that can't be a part of the system simply because the resources aren't there to utilize them. And the thinking is, is that um, it also, from a macroeconomic perspective, if it allows growth in the economy, assuming that, because Barbados is overtaxed, but the other countries aren't so much so, assuming that we, our tax regimes are consistent with that growth, then it should redound to increase wages throughout society generally. And that's the reason why we invite companies from Canada. We, we heavily are involved in uh, attracting companies from the UK. Um, recently, they have some tax laws that made Barbados more attractive generally. That has been done to help with wage growth generally. We are a consumption-driven economy. 80% of our economy is based